put in the strategy. So I've got five minutes and I just want to like to comment about uh, South Africa's just energy transition and also what we're doing at the National Research Foundation of South Africa. So as you will recall that in 2021, the South African government secured financing of about nine billion uh, US dollars package from donors around the world, the US, UK, Germany, France and the EU during the COP26. And that was part of the uh, climate change uh, pact, the Glasgow Pact, which involved the signing of a political declaration by the countries forming the International Partners Group. So the South African government aimed to ensure that the Just Energy Transition Partnership went beyond what we already know are the challenges in energy, particularly with our state-owned uh, company, ESCOM. Um, so we expanded the pact. So our strategy as a country is marked by complex country platform strategy, which represents the first country-led but globally influential initiative of its kind. Building on what Kate said, and Kate spoke very much for all of us, um, we do work as a team across the continent and, uh, and she very kindly shared her remarks ahead of time and gave, gave us a, a chance to comment and really built on the what we've had to say at the AAUN at previous forums. So um, my colleague or our colleague Tegan Green. And as I said, I am his mirror image, Australia's ambassador in Zimbabwe, I'm very proud to be so. I'm also accredited to Zambia, Malawi, the DRC and the Republic of the Congo as well, so I have quite the patch. Um, but it's not a competition amongst our heads of mission here as to who, how many countries we've all got. Kate, uh, as Jenny, my colleague, has already said, Kate, um, our colleague from Mauritius, has done a wonderful job in contextualising really um, some of the issues um, uh, around uh, the, the topic of just energy transition. She very well captured the challenges. towards a sustainable energy future is not just a matter of policy. It is a matter of survival, prosperity, and the legacy we leave for future generations. For some who don't know, Nigeria is Africa's largest economy and the most populous nation. Right now, Nigeria stands at a crossroad of our transformative energy journey. Hopefully by the end of my talk, there will be some answers to that. So there will be a little bit of background, the global emission, and including Australian emission, and I'll show a little bit about African CO2, and of course methane from the ruminants, and also from rice paddy, and also the marshy areas contribute 19 percentage, then fluorocarbons, 15, and the nitrous oxide is very dangerous, largely coming from And I just wanted to show you, use it as a, uh, a vehicle.
to this decarbonisation journey. Because if you look at Africa and Australia, you can see that uh, this website, Climate Trace, is very handy to highlight uh, where the large point source uh, carbon emissions are coming from. And you can see here, for example, the orange is typically oil and gas projects, the orange circles there. Um, the uh, yellow uh, is the uh, cities, and the uh, purple ones are typically uh, manufacturing plants like cement. So if we look at somewhere like um, uh, Algeria, Australia, there will be lithium, uh, nickel, and so on needed for solar, wind, electricity, uh, grids, and, and electric vehicle batteries, of course. Um, there are many ways of looking at justice, many dimensions to it. I won't give you a political studies lecture on that, but I'll take a really material definition as well of um, uh, uh, distributional justice, which is one element of it. So it's deciding who gets what when. It's a very simplistic definition. But in this context, we can say that it's definitely geopolitical competition of who gets the critical minerals. Um, uh, what? It's the critical minerals that there's a rush um, to secure these supply chains. Um, so there's distributional justice, um, and there's also human rights, um, which, which Peter, you know, strategic alliances to uh, trade agreements, and we see the different um, um, <coughs> global powers, industrial powers, competing um, for to secure their, their supply chains. Uh, the definition of critical minerals itself is in here of uh, South Africa hosting uh, the G20 next year. Um, our centre has um, has collaborated this year with the G20 in Brazil uh, to uh, develop a, a T20 policy brief with the African Mineral Development Centre. Um, uh, Dr. Rispa, um, we, we have uh, done a search on the, um, on the global level and then also in Australia, if you track where the mineral deposits are that are currently being developed um, against the local government areas and you disaggregate from the national level, you actually find that there are many of um, Australia's uh, So that's going to be a great and uh, yeah, it's, it's a very special start this evening, and uh, it's a start for Pedert uh, and, uh, and, and Africa and Alanda of, of what we hope will be another big week for promoting Africa in Australia. And, uh, this year we have uh, Africa and Alanda following on from your meeting for the next couple of days, and uh, this year we have to, uh, currently we have uh, Thank our partners who are represented here, those who have spoken and those who will speak later, for being with us AUL. And I think uh, one reason why I was chosen to be speaking on behalf of AUL is because I'm one of the newest members. <laughs> I was, but uh, now the network is growing, actually faster than I, anyone would expect. And so we are glad that we are always gathered in this uh, event where not only the uh, thing is, but also the Zakaski Mega Village for the Yoruba communities in Western Australia. Uh, OEC is the umbrella body for the 54 countries, 
And so as I stand here, I am representing the 54 countries in Africa. Uh, we have a very, very strong organization which looks after all the uh, African uh, issues. We are advocates, we work with the government, we work with the university, we work with the community, we work with all of them, including working with women to see that uh, 